On this week's edition of New York Now, lawmakers leave Albany. This year's legislative session in New York is over. We'll tell you what passed and what didn't. Our own Daryl Camp and Karen DeWitt from New York State Public Radio join us with details and analysis. And later, it's been 10 years since New York legalized same-sex marriage. We'll speak with Assemblymember Danny O'Donnell, who led the charge. I'm Dan Clark, and this is New York Now. Today, the Senate majority Welcome to this week's edition of New York Now. I'm Dan Clark. In Albany, there's something called the Big Ugly. We get one in March, and sometimes we get one in June. A Big Ugly is a huge bill that lawmakers introduce and pass that includes all the major policy items they've negotiated for weeks. It's all the important stuff that you'd see in the news. And that way, they can make all of those laws in just one huge bill. But this year was different. Lawmakers ended this year's legislative session this week by passing some pretty significant items, all introduced, debated, and passed separately. And while advocates had hoped that Democrats could deliver on a range of new policy measures, not everything made the cut. Take a look. At the start of the week, no one knew what state lawmakers were going to do in the final days of this year's legislative session. That wasn't for lack of ideas. From parole reform to gun crime, lawmakers had plenty to consider. And some of them didn't make the cut, like a pair of environmental bills that would have taxed carbon emissions. Senate Environmental Chair Todd Kaminsky said they're still figuring out how to transition to cleaner energy without hurting consumers. It's really important to say to somebody, hey, go get an EV. And if their interest, well, I don't have the money to do that, or I can't get a charging station in my home, we have to be able to give them an answer as to how to get there. And I, re I really believe we're, we're close to be able to do that. Um, but to impose the serious costs that would come with that without giving people a uh, affordable alternative is, is an issue. But a series of other measures were approved by lawmakers, including legislation targeted at the criminal justice system. That's the less is more parole bill. That makes it so technical violations of parole won't send someone back to prison. A technical violation is something like being late to an appointment. More serious violations, like a new criminal charge or violating parole on purpose, would prompt a hearing to decide if someone should go back behind bars. And the bill's sponsors say that'll help people recently released from prison move on with their lives. It says that we're not going to come in and penalize you for everything. We're going to understand that we got to work with you and that we got to make sure that you are successful at every step. That bill was opposed by Republicans who view it as part of a continued effort by Democrats to shift New York's criminal justice system in favor of the accused and away from law enforcement. Senate Republican leader Rob Ort. Crime is, you know, on the rise in every major metropolitan city in, in, in the state, across vast swaths of the state, and they're doing things that are going to make it even worse. Two other criminal justice bills, called Elder Parole and Fair and Timely Parole, didn't get enough support to pass this year. Those would have granted more parole opportunities to older individuals and made it harder to deny parole for those eligible. Advocates even slept outside the Capitol in the final days of session to get attention from lawmakers. Anthony Dixon is a supporter of the bills. We want to see this chapter close where we stop uh, punishing people needlessly who are no longer a risk uh, of committing a crime if released. But lawmakers were able to strike deals on other measures, like new gun laws. Democrats approved legislation that will make it illegal to own a gun in New York that doesn't have a serial number. That's to cut down on so-called ghost guns, which are assembled part by part and usually untraceable by law enforcement. Assemblymember Linda Rosenthal is a Democrat from Manhattan. Law enforcement has uh, conveyed that they need all guns to be traceable and serialized. When people build ghost guns from kits at home, they create a firearm that cannot be traced. And New Yorkers will soon be able to sue gun manufacturers over incidents of gun violence. Lawmakers passed a bill that allows lawsuits when gun violence creates a public nuisance, which is a legal term. That was sponsored by Assemblymember Pat Fahey, a Democrat from Albany. It's, it's going to be a high threshold to bring these types of cases. Um, however, this could be a game changer 
danger with stopping that flow that we know is hitting our streets throughout the throughout the state. And while environmental advocates didn't get some of the big ticket items they were hoping for this year, Democrats did coalesce around a handful of related measures. One lowers the amount of lead allowed in drinking water at schools. That's from Senate Health Chair Gustavo Rivera. And so making sure that we test it, we test it often, uh, is, is the way to make sure that we can identify the places that it needs to be remedi remediated. And another bill requires water utilities to test for a series of emerging contaminants. Smaller utilities in New York don't have to monitor the water supply for certain contaminants like PFAS chemicals, which are believed to raise the risk of cancer. The bill approved by lawmakers requires all water utilities to test for contaminants, regardless of their size. It's sponsored by Senator James Scoofus, a Democrat from the Hudson Valley. We all take water for granted. Um, we bathe in it, we cook with it, we drink it. And it's not until something goes wrong with the water that we realize how dependent we are on it. But the, the issue oftentimes is, we don't know that there is something wrong with the water. But another top issue fell out of negotiations before lawmakers left Albany. That's the New York Health Act. That bill would set up a single-payer health care system in New York, ending network restrictions, premiums, and out-of-pocket costs, while adding a new payroll tax. Supporters rallied at the state capitol this week to push for its passage, but Democrats couldn't reach a deal. Assembly Health Chair Dick Gottfried, who carries the bill, said a major roadblock has been opposition from public sector labor unions, who fear their coverage won't be the same under the new system. And, you know, I understand that if you're if you've if you've got a, a package that you've been living with for a long time and someone comes along and says, you know, this would be a whole lot better. That takes some persuading. We've been working on that slowly over the years. A lot of the labor movement is on board. We've got to get the rest of it on board. Lawmakers aren't scheduled to return to Albany until next January, but that could change if something comes up in the meantime. But we could see lawmakers back at the Capitol this summer if the assembly moves forward with impeachment against Governor Andrew Cuomo. The Senate, meanwhile, confirmed two new judges to the Court of Appeals, New York's highest court. One of them, Anthony Canataro, sailed right through. But former Nassau County DA Madeline Singus was met with some resistance from lawmakers who didn't want another prosecutor on the high court. State Senator Alessandro Biaggi. The New York State Court of Appeals, our state's highest court is entrusted with issuing decisions that shape the fundamental rights of all New Yorkers. And I cannot, in good faith, vote in favor of DA Singus's nomination. I believe her past support of her for maintaining harmful criminal justice policies renders her unfit to serve on the Court of Appeals. And so today I vote nay and encourage my colleagues to do the same. But most Democrats voted in favor of Singus, citing her experience in office, including programs to divert people from the criminal justice system. Our Daryl Camp was the only reporter at the Capitol this week to catch Singus after she testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee. And she said she wasn't surprised. DA Singus, how did it go in there? I was happy to have an opportunity to answer questions. Thank you. Okay, uh, were you expecting to be thrilled as much as you were? Um, I've been a DA for many years. Nothing surprises me, and it wasn't, uh, it was an appropriate grilling because this is an important spot. And Daryl's with me now in studio with Karen DeWitt from New York State Public Radio. Thank you both for being here. Sure thing. Daryl, it really seemed like she didn't want to talk to you. Not only did she not want to talk to me, she didn't want to talk to anyone. So on the way into the Capitol, Ryan Tarnelli actually caught her as well. She didn't even look at him. He only got one question and she just kind of blew right by him. And I was staking out outside the blue room and I thought, OK, is she going to try to evade me? But uh, myself and another photographer, we were both like, hey, let's hope she doesn't run away while her staffers were in the hallway. So I think that they were just like, OK, let's deal with this. But the problem is, she was in a tight spot because a lot of the Democrats were very critical of her and she didn't want to say too much or anything that could cause her to be canceled or that would cause mm -hmm. some sort of blowback. So she was very careful with her words. So I understand why she didn't really want to talk to anyone, but I'm glad that she at least looked at me. She didn't look at Ryan. A true attorney. Mm -hmm. really. Yeah, but on the other hand, she is going to be a judge on the Court of Appeals. The highest So there court? should be some public accountability. And unfortunately, that's a pattern we're seeing at the Capitol as this end of the session concludes. 
that the Capitol is still closed to the public. Even though Governor Cuomo announced May 19th, the state is reopening, you can go to a baseball game, you can go to the theaters when they reopen with some restrictions, but the public is not allowed in the Capitol. And it hasn't just been the court nominees, it's been the legislative leaders that we haven't seen, the rank and file lawmakers. You can't, as a reporter, just walk on the floor and get a sense of what's going on. So I think that really illustrates that I think people, they're starting to have the mentality, oh, well, reporters, we don't have to talk to reporters anymore. <laughs> right. Any semblance of transparency that existed in Albany before the pandemic is gone at this point. The legislative leaders don't really make themselves available. The Senate Majority Leader made herself available last night to reporters, which is great, but we haven't seen the Assembly Speaker in... Uh, at least a few weeks. Yeah, and even that was kind of unannounced. It was late at night. I know this week I had been pressing for, even on Zoom, come on, let us ask some questions. Let us get a sense of what's going on with this kind of mysterious end of the session. When's the last time the governor had a press conference in Albany? Um, December? That's true too. Well, I have to quote Politico on this. I think they said this morning, 190 days. Yeah, so last <laughs> so year. So it's been a while, yes. And the thing yeah. that I found frustrating and you alluded to it is, is that in a regular session, us as reporters at the Capitol, if we need to catch a lawmaker, we can see them in the hall and just talk to them. And more importantly, the way that we know what's going on every session during the busier times in March and June is as reporters, we usually stake out rooms where they're meeting on really big important issues that are going to affect the entire state. And now, because everything is still on Zoom, there aren't lawmakers going in the hall, and even the ones that are at the Capitol are doing the Zoom conferences from their offices, which is understandable given the pandemic, right. but the availability has definitely diminished. Yeah, it used to be really hard to keep a secret in the Capitol yeah. because somebody would leak it, some lobbyist walking by or some staff member, or you'd see someone going to a meeting, and now it's really pretty easy for them to really keep things very close to the vest. And I, it's not just you know us whining. I mean, we represent the public, and the public doesn't get the full picture of what's going on there. And I think that's a shame. Yeah, and as we said in our story at the start of the show, at the start of this week, I don't think that anyone knew what was going to happen. I would argue that as reporters, we didn't we knew what the top issues were broadly, but there were a whole bunch of bills that passed both houses this week that are very important that we had no heads up, like the, lawmakers were just not holding events. The best example was yesterday, both you and I were just sitting around hoping and waiting for news on clean slate <laughs> all day through the night, like four o'clock, we're like, are y'all finished? Are we done? What's going on here? Because there, was, there were rumblings about a finalized deal. Turns out that didn't pass. And if you asked me last week, was the uh, ban or the ability to sue manufacturers going to pass for gun, gun crimes? Yeah. And as opposed to clean slate, I would have said absolutely not. But here we are, and the inverse has happened because no one's accessible. Yeah, that was strange. That really took me by surprise, the mm -hmm. gun liability, because I asked the assembly that spokesperson through email. I said, so that's a two-way deal? And he said, yes. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, how come no one's talking about this? This is this this would normally they would consider this a major achievement. It's so a I was first thinking, in the nation law. I know. I was thinking. So did that really happen or not? It was just <laughs> very strange that yeah these things would slip by overnight and just the whole lack of communication. And the Adult Survivors Act that passed the Senate last week unanimously. The Assembly's like, well, we don't know. Right, and that's based on the Child Victims Act would give a one-year window of opportunity so adult survivors of sexual assault could sue their abuser. And that was passed by the Senate along with a number of other anti-sexual harassment uh, laws, closing some loopholes in the laws, and it just kind of sank in the assembly without really an explanation. And that one, it, I, I'm finding that one kind of confounding because there were members that supported it. And Bipartisan. Why, yes, and why, parties. yes, and it, it, that's right. In the, in the Senate, many of those pills, I believe, were passed unanimous. Mm -hmm. So that was very strange, and we didn't, we still do not have a direct accounting of why was it, you know, okay to not take up those bills that there seemed to be general agreement were needed. Right, and, and we were talking before we came on the air for me, it seems more and more like the moderate Democrats in Albany are really running the show. And maybe that's just because uh, the more to the left Democrats, there's not as many of them as the moderates. And to be fair, the moderates, uh, most of them have been in the legislature much longer 
than the progressives. So they're, they're more in leadership positions, I think. So you think this is providing cover for them because they don't have to say why it's not getting done. The progressives can be out there yelling about it and then they don't have to actually act on yes, it. Yes, I think if this was a regular session and we had advocates at the Capitol and lobbyists at the Capitol and more accountability from lawmakers, I think you would see more action on legislation that might have tanked because lawmakers are just taking cover at this point. Yeah, well, you, you know, it's a good example of that is the New York Health Act, which is yes. essentially an act single payer health care, which has enough sponsors to pass if it were on the floor. And I, I tend to think that too, that the moderates, they don't really want to do that. Have New York State run all the health care for everybody because Honestly, you know, the New York bureaucracy doesn't have the best <laughs> reputation. So that could be another way of just trying to hold that back without having to say why. There were shades of blue, <laughs> though. I was telling you when we first got in <laughs> early this morning, moderate comes in degrees. And yes. Governor Cuomo, compared to a lot of the <laughs> further left Democrats, is functionally a moderate. So when you have that and when you look at who did and did not call for him to step aside when the sexual harassment allegations kind of crept up, it sort of gives you a sense that there is still a political establishment. Um, some people would call it a swamp, I guess. I, I wouldn't necessarily use that term. But there is a status quo that people aren't necessarily comfortable disrupting. And, yeah, and, and the assembly was actually did not act on bills that you could guess that Governor Cuomo probably didn't want acted yes. on. So that's and that has been something that's been speculated on is the assembly speaker Carl Hasty providing cover for Governor Cuomo right now. For, I mean, we have no have way. scandals. What's I going mean, yes. cover for one? Oh, wait, I know. I know. That's the elephant in the room we're not talking about, right? Well, let's talk about that with a minute left. Yes. The impeachment probe is going on in the assembly. Mm -hmm. It may go forward with impeachment at any point. And as we were talking about the moderate Democrats, Karen, how do you think that will happen in the assembly? Is do you think that that will provide some tension. Well, right now it does seem like the impeachment inquiry is providing cover for Cuomo. It's been three months and they gave a brief update a couple of weeks ago saying, well, we're interviewing some more people. I guess until they prove otherwise that they're really serious, we have to assume that they are dragging it out and that it's not going to happen despite the governor being, you know, under scrutiny for sexual harassment, possibly hiding nursing home numbers, federal investigation, attorney general's investigation, <laughs> um, you know, all of that stuff swirling around as the session ends. Right. Well, that is a story for another day. Many Karen, more days. <laughs> <laughs> Karen DeWitt from New York State Public Radio, our own Daryl Camp. Thank you both so much. Sure. So now we'll look back and a look ahead. Ten years ago, New York became the largest state to legalize same-sex marriage. But that win didn't come easy. Lawmakers voted down same-sex marriage in 2009. So when it came up again two years later, no one knew how it would turn out. And in the end, four Republicans joined Democrats in the Senate and it passed. But before that, Assemblymember Danny O'Donnell had spent years pushing for marriage equality. He's one of the few openly gay members of the legislature, so it was personal to him. And since then, he's led the charge on other laws involving the LGBTQ community. We spoke this week. Assemblymember Danny O'Donnell, thank you so much for being here. It is my pleasure to see you again, and thank you for having me. So it's been 10 years since New York State passed marriage equality. You carried the bill at the time. It was a very emotional debate and a very tense debate in New York because we didn't actually know if the bill was going to pass when it came to the floor of the Senate. I want you to take me back 10 years. What was going through your head during those final days when we really didn't know what was gonna happen? Well, my house uh, had passed it already three times before we got to 2011. And so um, we knew that we had a shot at the Senate. And so we were gonna have to pass it again. I, I was kept out of the loop about who the senators were, who they were counting on. I knew there were enough of them. Um, but, uh, and many senators said to me, I would like to vote for this, but I just can't. You know, my voters won't go for that. And it was a real vindication um, of the importance and the role of having LGBT people at the table. Uh, because in my house, for sure, a number of my colleagues just couldn't vote against me and against us. And that ability to make it personal um, and then I promised all my colleagues, including the senators, if they voted yes, I'd invite them to my wedding, which I did. It was a very large wedding, but, um, but it was a joy-filled wedding where members of our community could be in the same room with the people who had the courage to vote yes. And in 2007, there was only 35% of 
the approval for it. So the people who started this with me actually exhibited a great deal of bravery. I feel like the public and members of the legislature saw marriage equality as the end of the fight for LGBTQ rights. And you and I being members of the community know that it was more of like a beginning, a next chapter in a whole load of issues that affect the community, you and I being members of it. And I'm wondering over the past decade in New York, we have done a few bills targeted at the community. What stuck out to you as somebody that's been so involved in this debate? Well, we knew that there would be a backlash. Um, and I didn't expect the bash, backlash to be about bathrooms. But shortly after marriage was the law of the land, all of a sudden states are passing laws saying uh, who has access to a bathroom. Uh, last year I wrote a bill that said if a bathroom has one toilet in it and the door locks, anybody can use it. Uh, and the trans community were the ones who were targeted which was very unfortunate. And so uh, that bill is now in effect here in New York State. Um, we also um, passed the Gender Recognition Act uh, this week. And that was very important because it's a mechanism to allow people to get documents and IDs that match who they are. So a lot of trans people are exposed to violence and things when their physical appearance doesn't match their driver's license or, uh, you know, they give their license to get into a bar and it doesn't match what the person is seeing. And that can often lead to violence. Um, and so that's a very important thing. And additionally, we are putting uh, neutral gender markers. So someone can choose to not be male or female, but to be X. And that is very important as well. So a lot of these things must seem incremental to people but they are not incremental to the people uh, affected who live in fear because of that. They're absolutely game changers for members of the community. And I'd love to get your perspective on this as well. What do you think is on the horizon in terms of the LGBTQ community? I feel personally that in the past few years, issues involving transgender people have really come to the spotlight as we see more transgender people in popular culture and in the media. But I'd love to get your perspective on that because I think a lot of people don't realize the issues that involve the community because they've never had to deal with it. Well, I'm a lot older than you, Mr. Clark. And so <laughs> the world was very different when I was younger. There was nobody who went to the prom with their boyfriend in Comac High School South in 1978. And um, now we have kids younger and younger who are coming out uh, as lesbian or gay and coming out as trans. And they're in school environments. And you know we have to make sure that we protect those children. We have to make sure that uh, kids are taught about the accomplishments of the LGBT community, of which there are many. Um, and we also need to fight um, to get recognition for the work that we do. Uh, a great number of times, um, newspapers have written me out of the story. They just don't, I wrote a bill, they don't even put my name in the newspaper. And um, whether it's internalized homophobia or just hatred, doesn't matter to me. Um, and so I push back and I say, how could you write a story about a bill I worked on for five years and not mention my name? Right, which kind of brings me to my next question. I'm curious about your experience with your colleagues in the legislature. There are only five openly gay members of the state legislature. There are 213 total members of the state legislature. And I'm wondering how challenging it is when you approach your colleagues with these issues as people that just don't have the experience with them and may not understand why they're important. And is it difficult to talk with your colleagues about these issues? There is a lot. You know, when I first arrived, um, people said to me, my colleagues, I don't know any gay people. And I would say, well, do you leave your house? Do you get your hair cut? Do you, like, what do you mean you don't know any gay people? Um, that has changed quite a bit. And a number of my colleagues over time have come to me. So, well, I have this cousin or, you know, my brother. Or, it's fascinating in that sense. Um, but we are obviously more accepted in urban areas than, than rural areas. And um, a lot of that needs to change, too. You know, when I was given an award in California, um, I went to the VIP reception uh, and there were two very handsome young men in Speedos. And um, one of these young men grew up in Montana on a, a cattle ranch. 
And when he came out to his mother, his mother, the cattle rancher, said, uh, the gays are the only people who are not born to their own kind. How profound is that, right? You know, it's a community that you have to choose to identify. And if you're successful, choose to love yourself enough to protect yourself. Um, and not everyone gets that chance. And so uh, the discrimination is real. The invisibility is real. Um, and we have to fight to make sure that the world that we lead is better than the world that we grew up in for the people who are there now. Absolutely. And I could talk about this all day, but we do have to leave it there. Assembly Member Danny O'Donnell, thank you so much, as always, for talking about this. Thank you. And I'm sure we'll see more LGBTQ-related bills when lawmakers come back to Albany in January. But we do have to leave it there for this week. Have a great week and be well. Funding for New York Now is provided by WNET and by the Dominic Ferrioli Foundation.